everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We are just going to give it another couple of minutes um, to let people get connected. We've got 9.59 a.m. Eastern Time on our end. Um, so hang tight and the webinar will begin shortly. Good morning, everyone. We had a few folks logging on, so if you'll just give us one more minute, we'll begin the program in just one minute. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Marie Beeson, the Capacity Building Director for Prosperity Indiana, and I get to welcome you today for our Prosperity Indiana's Changing for Good series, a series of webinars to help you navigate the challenges associated with emerging from the pandemic. Couple housekeeping items before we start the webinar. Please know that all lines are muted, but we want this program to be interactive. So please ask questions by typing your questions in the question box. Again, we would love for you to get your input. Um, so please type questions in the question feature of GoToWebinars. And if you lose internet connectivity today, just reconnect using the link that was emailed to you. It's very simple. Also, the presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Prosperity Indiana COVID-19 Hub. For those of you who are new to Prosperity Indiana, we are Indiana's cross-sector intermediary for organizations dedicated to community economic development. With nearly 200 members, our network builds a better future for our communities by creating inclusive opportunities to build assets and improve Hoosiers' lives. I encourage you all to visit our website, prosperityindiana.org, to learn more about the resources, engagement opportunities, adv advocacy, and programs we provide to our members and hope you can be a part of our growing network. And now let's set the stage for this morning's program with a quick poll to get your thoughts on how the pandemic has impacted mental health. Please select your answer to how much the pandemic has increased the need to address mental health issues. Michaela, would you start the poll, please? So please share if you think substantially, somewhat, a bit, or not at all, how the pandemic has increased our need to address mental health issues. We'll give it just a moment, and then Michaela will jump in and let us know what the results are.
Marie, it looks like the overwhelming answer has been the pandemic has substantially increased the need to address mental health issues with over 90% voting for it. Great. Shock, shock, Danielle. So obviously the pandemic has made an impact on um, mental health, particularly in um, BIPOC communities. So the need is great, and that's exactly why we're here this morning. To begin, I would like to turn the program, oh, I would like to introduce our speakers for today's program. They are all licensed social workers and have master's degrees from Washington University, St. Louis. Marcus Brown has obtained a direct practice experience in a wide, wide variety of settings, um, serving as a youth specialist, crisis intervention clini clinician, psychiatric social worker, and behavior health consultant. Currently, he is a second year PhD student at the University of Houston and works as a research institute. Kendra Johnson is co-owner of MKTI Social Work Consulting and currently serves as the board chair for Creating Resources and Opportunities Women Need, or CROWN, as well as regional clinical supervisor for Lifeline Youth and Family Services. Kendra has experience working in various settings with diverse populations, as well as serving as a therapist and a field instructor for BSW and MSW students. And finally, joining us via telephone is Monique Johnson. Monique is co-owner of MKTI Social Work Consulting and has experience as a therapist, hospital social worker, field instructor for BSW and MSW students. She is a clinical director at a group home for teen mothers and their children as well as serving as an adjunct professor. So welcome speakers, thank you so much for being here. And we'll turn it over to Monique who will start our program. Hello everyone. My name is Monique Johnson, and I am a licensed clinical social worker, as is Kendra Johnson and Marcus Brown. And I am excited to be here with you all. In this workshop, you will examine the social problem of the unmet needs of Black and Indigenous people of color, how the conditions of our housing, employment, and healthcare system affect health outcomes, the impact of mental health in Indiana, and discuss recommendations and implications. By the end of this presentation, you will have an increased awareness and understanding of racial health disparities and mental health care among BIPOC individuals. You will be able to identify the differences and similarities among racial minorities, specifically African Americans and majority groups regarding mental health experiences, needs, and beliefs and you will be provided recommendations to address the relationship between the BIPOC community's mental health needs and the influence of community contextual factors, social norms, and stressors of discrimination and racism. Thank you, Monique. When we um, attempt to address a social problem, like a societal problem or a problem within our agencies or organizations, we have to stop, like, stop to think, what is a social problem? So a social problem is a uh, condition or behavior that negatively impact individuals who are marginalized. In this case, mental illness is a huge social problem among the BIPOC community, which we will examine throughout this presentation. The effects of mental illness can lead to poverty, unemployment, and homelessness, as well as other factors that could impact the BIPOC community from progressing. Approximately 43 million adults in the U.S. experience a mental illness in a given year. That is, every one in five adults experience a mental illness. Nearly 60 percent of these adults in the U.S. received less than uh, adequate mental health services last year. So these individuals have experienced a mental health need, but less than half of these individuals receive, receive mental health services. When a social problem exists, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is affecting these individuals from receiving mental health services? 
a health, a mental health disparity is basically a particular type of differences closely related to social, economic, race, ethnicity, and environment changes, as well as religion, income, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity. If you take a look at the picture on the right hand side, majority of these individuals comprise of the different factors that makes up a health disparities, whether it be gender, whether it be sexual orientation. The point is, is that as a mental health disparities, they are complex. They are impacted by social and economic status. They are impacted by race and ethnicity. And when you hear that a certain population is 2.2 times more likely to experience a problem, then you have to consider what is the health disparities that is causing these individuals to progress and to become well and to become healthy. Social determinants of health are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. As you can see, education, healthcare, neighborhood, your social environment, and your income stability are all social determinants of health. They include factors that can impact these individuals from receiving access to a quality education, to healthcare services. They impact individuals who live in urban communities who may not have access to uh, fresh produce or to services to or in order to help these individuals to feel better and to live a healthy, productive life. The conditions in which we live explain in part why some Americans have access to more services than others. We will examine throughout the um, presentation each social determinants of health to provide you examples about what these aspects means and how they impact the BIPOC community. Because of mental health disparities and because of the conditions in which people are born, work, play, and live, individuals who are marginalized have unmet needs. Racial and ethnic minorities tend to have significantly higher unmet needs for mental health care than their non-minority counterparts. What is an unmet need? An unmet need may, may be the need for mental health care, but these individuals are not using mental health services. Why? How come? Mental health disparities social determinants of health. These people may live in neighborhoods that may not have access to transportation in order for them to get to community agencies. These people may live in um, neighborhoods that have low quality education in order for them to learn about resources and um, services to help them meet their needs. Also, another definition of unmet needs is when you have a mental illness and you have mental health services, but the mental health services is insufficient. What that means is that the uh, mental health services is not meeting the needs of the BIPOC community. That means that something is missing to the piece of the puzzle because if they are receiving services, but services are not meeting their needs, what can we do in order to help these individuals um, have the services that they need to be healthy and to be well. So in our agencies and in our um, organizations, we have to examine what is the unmet need of the BIPOC community in order for them to remain in treatment. When we um, look at unmet needs, this graph right here is very important. Geographic is an important but yet understudied area for disparities in mental health care among the BIPOC community. This graph right here shows uh, the differences in unmet needs in all of the US, uh, whether it be the Northeast, the Midwest, the South, and the West. Let me take a moment to explain this graph. The national average for unmet need is 67.66%. If we take a look at this graph, this graph um, represents Black, Latino, and Asian populations. And let's hone in on the Midwest, where we are in um, Indiana. If you take a look at this graph, see who fell behind the national average of unmet need in all of the U.S. every time. Exactly. As you can see, um, 
those who are who represent the BIPOC um, community fell behind the national average of unmet need in mental health care compared to all of the regions in the U.S. If we take a look at the Midwest, we can see that um, Black, Latino uh, fell behind the uh, national average. So we have to examine what does this mean? This means all in all, being a member of a particular racial and ethnic minority group increases your odds of having an unmet need in mental health care in the United States compared to their non-minority counterparts. BIPOC fell behind the national average in unmet need in every region of the U.S. Now let's do a quick activity. So I want you to imagine that you are cooking dinner and you're chopping up some vegetables and then you cut your hand. And so because you cut your hand, you rinse it off and you throw a Band-Aid on it really quickly. And so everything appears to be fine. It's covered up, the Band-Aid is on there. And then let's say the next day, about 24 hours later, you take the Band-Aid off and you notice that it looks infected. The wound kind of looks infected. Um, it's, it's not, it doesn't look where, what it looked like yesterday. And so you're like, oh, I need to address this. I need to be proactive. So I need to go to the doctor and I need to, or I need to go to the hospital and make sure um, this does not become a huge issue. So when you think about mental health and the BIPOC community, think about how, and Michaela's gonna put this question in the question chat, how, what does it look like to put a Band-Aid on the BIPOC mental health care so that you can't really see what's going on versus actually addressing the need and being proactive. Some examples of this would be creating more housing versus creating more housing and actually creating ways to engage people into mental health services. Or is it creating more jobs or is it creating more employment opportunities that actually have benefits that cover mental health care costs? And so, Michaela, could you read a few if, from the chat, answers that came from the chat? Yeah, it looks like we might need to give everyone um, just a minute to respond. So again, the question um, is in the chat and you can put your response into the question box, which I know sounds confusing, but hopefully everyone's just taking a minute to type out some of their responses. And one more example, I'll give one more example. One more example would be, is it that we just need more people in more people being admitted into the hospital or does it look like more long-term care, not that just initial engagement, but more long-term care to really support people in the BIPOC community with mental health? If no one has anything. Um, I just have a partial thing. It looks like someone, oh, here we go. Um, so someone said, I, you know, it simply means the community doesn't get what they need. Um, that's the Band-Aid. Um, another person responded, adding mental health services versus ensuring those services are actually affordable. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you for those responses. Now let's take that mindset that we just thought about of actual a bende and then actually addressing and being proactive and look at Indiana specifically. So according to the Department of Health, my Office of Minority Health Report in 2019, they did a final report. And so looking at health outcomes. And so some of the health outcomes that they look like, looked at were infant mortality rates, maternal mortality, substance use, opioid misuse, um, and then also mental health. So for the purpose of, purposes of today, I'm looking specifically, looking specifically at mental health. They defined mental health access as access to insurance, access to treatment, 
quality and cost of insurance, special education about mental health, so awareness about mental health services, and then workforce availability. If you notice, halfway down the slide, 24% of adults with mental health issues report they are unable to get the treatment they need. So that ties back into what Marcus referenced earlier, the unmet need and not being able to access the services that you need. So let's go even deeper and let's break Indiana down by ethnicity. So this graph shows um, obviously that the, Bi the BIPOC community is significantly lower than the Caucasian community in Indiana. But if you look at the actual two access rankings listed on the screen, they indicate how much access to mental health care exists within the state. And so notice that there is one mental health professional per 500 people total in the state. But then there is one mental health professional per little over 3,000 Black people in the state. So just know that is over five times the lack of access to a mental health professional. So when we think about barriers, they identified some barriers in the study and they said their barriers were lack of insurance or inadequate insurance, lack of treatment providers, insufficient finances to cover costs, and lack of available treatment options, such as inpatient or having access to an individual therapist or intensive community services. So, and mind you, I want to point this out that this is pre-COVID because this happened in 2019. So imagine COVID and then 2021 just coming, we're still in COVID, but coming out of it, how this is significantly risen and how you um, even know that in the poll that you did earlier, that it is substantially an issue now. We also know though that while those barriers do exist, there are more barriers for the BIPOC community, such as mistrust for the mental health care system, a lack of representation, lack of knowledge, and lack of culturally relevant services. So I wanna share a personal story. So I moved to Indiana in 2017 and it took me about two years because rep representation for me is very important. And it took me about two years to find a black female primary care doctor that was covered by my insurance. And so even in, because I also believe that um, emotional self-care is very important and even therapists need therapists just so you can manage that secondary trauma that you sometimes get. And so in that, in talking to the primary, primary care provider and asking her like, oh, do you know any therapists of color? And her response to me was good luck with that. You should hurry up and get licensed so that you can be someone um, in place. And so I work in this field. And so imagine the barriers there are in the needs in the BIPOC community for those who don't work in this field. Let's let dig a little bit deeper into healthcare and mental health on the broader spectrum as it relates to BIPOC individuals. As Marcus stated, a person's mental health is shaped by various social, economic, and physical environments, which are the social determinants of health. In mental health care, health disparities do exist especially among BIPOC individuals. Health disparities affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial and ethnic group. Due to stigmas placed on the BIPOC community and lack of culturally competent care, minorities are more likely to receive schizophrenia diagnosis and be prescribed antipsychotic medications more than their non-minority counterparts. There are also strategies that research identifies that need to be addressed beyond initial interactions in outpatient and inpatient services. For example, research shows that minorities are less likely to receive family-based outpatient treatment, and family is an important cultural component to the BIPOC community, as we all know. And also, research shows that minorities are more likely to be hospitalized but less likely to receive outpatient services. 
And research also shows that the BIPOC community has emphasized the need for professionals to consider culture and religion together. BIPOC individuals are less likely to use mental health services than their white counterparts. Why? Because of historical misdiagnosis and mistreatment. Another social determinant of health that we will address is employment. Our health is determined in part by access to social and economic opportunities. The lack of social and economic statuses affect BIPOC individuals in many ways through poverty, food insecurity, housing instability, just to name a few, and ways to improve social and economic opportunities for BIPOC individuals include creating access to economic and job opportunities, um, employment opportunities that offer insurance and or EAP programs for mental health services, and not only providing insurance, but, all, but insurance that covers mental health services, and then quality of mental health treatment that incorporates the needs of the BIPOC community. And we see from research that even after BIPOC individuals receive mental health treatment, they show, um, especially Blacks and Latinos, show poor outcomes in occupational and social functioning compared to their white counterparts. So that means even if Black and Latino individuals get mental health treatment, they are still not performing as adequately in the employment and social environment compared to their white counterparts. And I wonder why that is. But just hold that thought as we move forward. The last social determinant of health that we will just focus on is housing. And this map is from 2013, and it shows Indiana's black population and the areas across the state where they live. And also in 2011, Latinos had the highest increase in their population growth in Indiana as well. BIPOC individuals, as you can see from the map, are highly concentrated in urban areas. There are 79 public housing agencies and 28 HUD approved housing counseling agencies in Indiana. And out of those 28 agencies, 12 are concentrated within the five counties that have the highest population of black individuals and 12 agencies provide Spanish speaking services. The dark blue means that there's more than 10% of the um, black population in those counties. And then it goes down from there. There are also 34 community mental health centers in Indiana's urban communities with 12 of those concentrated within the three within three of the counties that have the highest population of black individuals. So as you can see that housing and mental health services are being provided across the state and largely in um, urban communities. But there is still a disconnect in addressing the underlying mental health concern for BIPOC individuals because from Kendra's slide, you were able to see that there was only one mental health professional per 3,002 black individuals. So that means that only one in every 3,002 black individuals are accessing mental health services. Mental illness carries a major economic burden from the people impacted and for the community. The importance of the relationship between neighborhood and health continues to be recognized in regards to environment, the place where you live, and zip codes, which are strong predictors of a person's health. Homelessness is a social determinant of health, and housing is a basic need. In an August 2020 article from Fox 59, it reported that African Americans make up 54% of the homeless population for the point in time count in Marion County. The executive director for the Coalition for Homelessness Intervention and Prevention um, also known as CHIP, stated that Black people are constantly being overrepresented in the homeless population due to the systematic racism concerns with the criminal system. But that is a topic for another day. Thanks, uh, Monique. So let's take a moment to put this into perspective. So let's all take a field trip and go to a baseball game. 
And let's watch, hmm, let's say the uh, Cardinals versus the Cubs, right? So let's say that your particular organization receive grant money to um allow the um the the clients to go to the baseball game so that right there is an example of equality right so the goal with equality is that everyone has the same thing to be successful so if you look at the picture on the left everyone has a step um, stool in order to be able to go to the game and to watch the game but guess what you guys what doesn't equality do? Just think about it for a moment. If you, by looking at the picture, everyone cannot enjoy the game. So equality, it doesn't promote fairness. Let's transition a little bit and go over to equity, right? So the goal is to go from equality to equity, right? So if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, now everyone is able to enjoy the game. How come? Because with equity, you understand where people are and you provide them with the resources that they need to be successful. So basically, they realize that in order for everyone to enjoy the game, that last person needed an extra resource in order for him to be able to see the uh, Cubs hit the home run, right? In order for them to be able to see that they won the game. So basically, equity is leveling the playing field. Inequalities exist in housing, employment, mental health services, and they produce differences in health status and health determinants, which are considered unfair and unavoidable. Equality does not mean equity. I want to highlight again that equality is not equity. Our goal here today is to focus on bringing equity to the mental health system for BIPOC individuals. Hopefully we can all work ourselves out of a job and remove all barriers to anyone who is disadvantaged when being able to access services. And removing these barriers then reaches liberation. So what's being done in Indiana right now? So there are some state and national and even local organizations like NAMI Indiana, the Indiana Department of Health, Mental Health America, who do support mental health reform for the BIPOC community and just mental health reform in general. And I wanna highlight just two on this slide that really um, things that we noticed in creating this presentation, establishing a unified data collection system. And so this is important because data needs to be disseminated so that we are all using best practices to support the BIPOC community and their mental health. And then also local partnerships that can provide access to affordable housing, suitable employment and treatment. And that just goes back to the social determinants of health being very important and then meeting the needs and removing those barriers by creating partnerships among all three of those areas. And so when you look at, when you look at um, there is some awareness about the mental health challenges and there's some awareness and support for change, but what are the next steps? Marcus, I know you're showing a video right now, but um, I don't believe anyone's getting any audio for it. Okay, so um, it's not going to be able to be shared? Yeah, um, we're able to see it, but not okay. hear it. Uh, okay, but well, that defeats the purpose. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe okay. if y'all can just summarize it for everyone. I'm sorry about that. Okay, no problem. Okay, so I'll summarize the video. Um, the video is a video about something that is coming to Indiana. It is 988 for mental health help. So instead of dialing 911, you would dial 988. And this is a way to be proactive because there was such an increase during during COVID and then even now um, for mental health crises in the state of Indiana. And so what we wanted to highlight, this is a way to be proactive. This is a way to start addressing the mental health issues in, in Indiana as a whole, but also in, within the BIPOC community. And then, but one thing we want, I wanted to note is that this video came out at the end of May this year. And so when we found it two weeks ago, it had only 20 views. And so that really highlights the need for information to be disseminated because this would be a great resource. But if we don't know about it or people in the BIPOC community don't know about it, then how can they use it and how is it helpful and how is it addressing the need? And then one additional step that I wanna know is just making sure that even the call center workers, because in the video, one of the speakers said, state, we wanna make sure that mental health access for all people in Indiana. And so just making sure that the call center workers are culturally competent as well. So in during this research and just in just experience and the research that we found and just looking at the organizations who do support mental health reform for the BIPOC community and just changes happening in Indiana, these are critical suggestions for best course of action to address the needs in the BIPOC community. I'm only gonna highlight a few, but really improving the scope of training for staff and having representation in the professionals serving the BIPOC community. This is very important. As I said earlier, um, representation is, was important to me in my search for a primary care provider and even for a therapist, mental health provider. And so it is very important that people are able to see themselves and feel heard and have a voice. And then next is improving infrastructure of mental health services. So really engaging the BIPOC community beyond that initial interaction into the mental health system. Usually that initial interaction is hospitalization or um, maybe, maybe a phone call, but it isn't really a lasting change or support for them. So really creating a way so that you can eliminate stigmas and biases, but also getting family involved and getting them involved in the mental health process for a longer period of time so that they have those supports. So those social determinants of health and needs are met. And then lastly, incorporating a framework that advocates for health promotion. So it would be awesome, like I identified, like we identified that everybody has the same framework and is working together and so by the by people in the BIPOC community and people in the community as a whole in Indiana are able to really remove barriers and really get that health promotion for their social determinants of health, whether that's in employment, housing, in the healthcare system, just really having optimal health promotion. And so implications are designed to determine the effects of the recommendations on policy, practice, and research. So by incorporating the recommendations, you have the opportunity, well, we have the opportunity, you and me, to reduce stigma, increase trust into the mental health system by, and from the BIPOC community, understand the role of culture and religion, and fund best practices. It is important we address and begin to meet the needs of the BIPOC community in Indiana for optimal health outcomes. 
Lastly, I leave you with this quote by Jane Goodall. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Thank you. Thank you all. This presentation should have provided you with some guidance to move from disparity to parity. And that process is when you see and start to examine mental health disparity, um, move towards culturally competent approaches to reducing mental health disparities, and then begin to evaluate if, they are, if there are any reductions to the mental health disparity that you are addressing. If you would like to continue this conversation or explore the idea of a cultural broker, having someone to bridge the information of different cultural backgrounds for the purpose of producing change, our contact information is listed as well. Thank you so much, team. At this time, I would encourage everyone to use the question feature to submit your thoughts regarding um, the information shared or pose questions to our experts. Um, as responses continue to come in, Michaela, I know we have a couple in the uh, question box already. Do, would you like to um, share some of those for our panelists? Yeah, thank you so much, Marie. Um, so an earlier question that came through, um, the stat was given that there's one mental health professional per 3,002 Black people. Um, the person wanted to know, did you mean just one mental health professional of color or any mental health professional? The research was okay. stating one oh, mental sorry, health professional. So the research was studying one mental health professional in general. Okay, thanks. Meaning, uh, meaning that one, three, one, two, one per 3,002 Black people access mental health services. Okay, um, and then does Medicaid cover mental health services? Medicaid covers that initial interaction, I'm also gonna let Marcus jump in to here too, but remember I spoke about that initial interaction into um, the mental health care system. And so that usually looks like going into the hospital, um, but it's more what, what happens to qu that quality. So thinking about quality mental health care after that initial interaction into the mental health system. Yeah, in some cases like state insurance has been like, difficult to really cover the full spectrum of mental health services. So I was working for um, the St. Louis County Department of Public Health for years. And uh, people who had Medicaid were limited as to if they can have a psychiatrist or if they can have a, a clinical social worker or any type of services. So with Medicaid, you have to go to a specific type of agency or organization that has like wraparound services. And what I mean by that is like integrated care services where you can have access to a primary care doctor, where you can have access to a, a social worker or psychiatrist. But um, typically outside of those state funded agencies, Medicaid typically don't cover mental health services. And I also would like to say that um, if you, you are working with a client or if you have um, Medicaid, that they should not, um, usually a professional, whether that's a licensed clinical social worker, uh, therapist or counselor, whoever, whatever background they come from, they should not be charging them um, out of pocket, you know, for those services because they have Medicaid. So it's kind of a catch-22. Um, because of the ethics around charging someone who has Medicaid for um, mental health services, but also the limited access of where they can get those services because they have Medicaid. Great, thank you. Um, let me see. Um, so this person is asking, um, is there information out there about how people are coping um, 
with re-entry as you know we're moving out the moving out of the height of the pandemic restrictions and they're noticing a fair amount of anxiety about returning to normal activities like school and work and wondering how widespread that is and if there is a variation in ethnic racial and cultural groups well um given that we are coming out of the COVID area that research is still kind of fairly like new and uh, presenting itself so um as of right now um i do not know much about like the different racial um, backgrounds as far as like people coming out of COVID and having more anxiety and things of that sort but what i can say as a researcher is that research is being done in that area currently in order to determine the effects of COVID and people kind of return back to daily lives and normal life so um you should be um, expecting some literature about that um in the coming months from um scholars bill i will also add so i know the video didn't play but mental health america just for indiana they mentioned that their calls like crisis calls more than crisis calls more than doubled in during the pandemic and even currently and so we know it was it has increased and that their anxiety has increased, but we just don't have actual facts yet, is what Marcus is trying to say. Of what that looks like between each ethnicity. Um, and on that note about the video and the 988 emergency response, um, a couple of questions came through about that. Um, do you know further i know y'all commented that you had just um found that video pretty recently but do you have any additional information on how it's um being promoted or when it plans to be live and um do you know offhand where people can go for resources on that so i would say that video there were two or and then doing that work now um, for call centers for mental health and if you check out the video um, so it is uh, Indiana Mental Health Matters I think that's what the video was called and you can check it out on YouTube and they have lawmakers speaking and then they have professionals from those two um, organizations um, so the law was just passed and it'll be rolling out in um, 2022 uh, the 988 but there are two call centers um, right now and then I get the hope is that it grows and 988 will kind of be that um, Indiana number to call for mental health. Um, and I'm guessing most likely because there have been a predominantly, there's been a surge in calling 911 for mental health through COVID. And, you know, working in the hospital now, it, yeah, I can definitely <laughs> gauge the surge that, you know, just subjectively from my point of view, um in through covid and prior to covid just so everyone's clear um michaela and i will research and help post the both the video as well as any potential flyers that we have found um on the our website with this recording so you should be able to have access to the video that you can download easily and uh, watch at a later time we can make sure to include some of these additional resources in our follow-up email along with um, the slide deck and recording. Um, let's see, we still have lots more questions, which is great. <laughs> um, so do you all have any suggestions for resources or opportunities that could help providers become more culturally competent? anything on top of mind this person is um pursuing a graduate degree in the mental health counseling field yes so well one thing monique mentioned is that we on mkti so short consulting and we do do trainings so that um people are more culturally competent but the biggest thing too is really recognizing um the clients that you're serving and letting them use their voice and just listening to them and so that you can know 
okay, so is this a really a mental health issue? Is this a cultural issue? Um, or not even a cultural issue, is this something in culture that this is normal and happening? Or is this something more that I need to address? And then being open to, if you don't know, going to somebody who might. So if you have a supervisor, or if you have someone else in the field that is a part of the BIPOC community that you can ask questions of. So just being open to learning, being open to finding, going to find the information. And then also I, I tell them, I, I have 11 staff, I tell them professional development is very, very important. So finding trainings, um, looking for things so that you can continue to grow your skills and yes, for yourself. And also, I just want to highlight that as Andrew talked about the recommendation slides, you know, some of the recommendations that we mentioned as far as like partnering with community organizations who may work with BIPOC community more and seeing like if you guys can refer um, clients or what type of things that they do in order to help you guys become more aware would be really helpful as well. Just a follow up question on that. You've mentioned the connection between culture and religion a couple times. Do you see any best practices in connecting with faith based organizations um, or, or creating that referral network, Marcus, that you just mentioned that would help um, uh, highlight the understanding of that or provide um, a connection to, between uh, mental health and faith? Um, yeah, definitely. I think that it's important to always, you know, in the initial conduct the initial assessment and part of conducting it like that assessment and determining what are the strength based techniques that help these individuals progress and move forward. Right. So sometimes it's, it's not always about finding a, a faith based organization, but sometimes it's about uh, being able to allow that individual to pray or to, you know, in, in between sessions as you help the individual and just promoting that. So sometimes it's about encouraging and finding ways to incorporate how someone's spiritual needs can be, you know, um, incorporated into the services that they may receive. And, um, as a social worker, um, the way that we practice is if it's like not within our scope of practice, of course, we will refer to an agency that we both, the client and, and ourselves, feel the need that they would be suited better at the agency in order to get their needs met. Because we, we can't help everyone. We have to realize that, you know, some things is beyond our scope, right? And recognizing that is always a good first step. Okay. Michaela, it looks like we still have some more questions. Want to go ahead and read those off? Yeah, and quickly, um, I just want to say one of our attendees was super helpful, and I dropped it in a chat, um, a link on 988. Um, and again, we'll be sending that out. Um, someone wanted to know, um, for people who want to seek mental health services but um, live in an area where they may not have professionals there that they're comfortable with or lack of access, transportation, et cetera, um, are they able to utilize virtual appointments with a professional who may be located in a bigger city? So that will depend on the actual professional's licensing and state, depending on the state law. So each state has its own set of licensing standards for uh, telehealth. And so you just wanna, you have to make sure, there are some, because during the pandemic, some states said anyone um, from surrounding states can, or anyone from a different state can actually do therapy uh, with, or start, provide services by, via telehealth, but, I know some of those restrictions have actually come back. So you really have to make sure it depends on the state. You have to make sure that the state allows it because someone licensed in let's say Missouri doesn't necessarily have, it would be unethical if the state of Indiana does not allow them to provide telehealth services to people in Indiana. So you just really have to but there are, I, I do want to highlight though that, but there are 
a lot of professionals in Indiana who provide telehealth services. And so that would be more op ideal if someone who's already licensed it within the state. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like one more question here. So could you all speak to how generational perception within the BIPOC community has played into the struggle for mental health services? Um, it's a struggle within all populations, it seems, but older generations have struggled in understanding the needs and have set up psychological barriers in children and grandchildren, um, and that seeking services may be seen as a weakness. Um, so yes, could you please speak to how you've seen this and the generational differences in the BIPOC community and thoughts on overcoming those stigmas generationally? So, um, so I would say back to the, the slide that I did on healthcare and mental health, um, that, that start of the historical misdiagnosis and mistreatment um, just to speak to that first part of the question of um, the older generations and, you know, obviously you kind of take on, you know, the mindset as, you know, you go along. And so because of the, um, and I'm not sure how everyone's familiar with it, but I don't want to go into great detail, but because of the um, lack of um, appropriate services or lack of services in general um, in regards to mental health and um and just healthcare, uh there is a big stigma not even just for african americans in america but for other minorities um in, that incorporate the bipoc community as well and so um when you pass those things on down generationally that's how it gets ingrained within that society um and i mean we just <laughs> that's anything when we talk about the context of just america in general or any anybody but they're so deeply woven into our makeup that we have to be intentional about doing something different or thinking about something different. Um, and so, and then also I had mentioned in that housing piece, um, how uh, Chip had identified that um, African Americans are always um, proportionately like overrepresented in the homeless population and is due to the criminal system. And so, um, when you think about housing and, you know, do we allow people who may have a fel felony to get public housing or do we allow, like, what barriers are there when historically, if you think about how the criminal system came about after slavery and how that's so deeply woven, woven into our society, then there will always be struggles with housing and not just starting at the groundwork of this individual organization, but also those policy implications that go with it as well. And so, uh, but if someone doesn't have a basic need of housing, if I don't have anywhere to live tonight and I'm sleeping outside, that's going to affect, um, you know, if I'm gonna get a cold or catch the flu, or if my if bones are aching and then that's going to affect my brain and my mental health and you know just the neurological brain development so every, all of this connects with each other um and i would like kendra and marcus give a short answer um because i'm speaking very long but that question is um it's a lot of information to unpack for that question if that makes sense <laughs> yeah and i'll just like briefly give just i'll be brief so like Monique said, that's a lot to um, unpack. And I think it, it starts with just one step at a time. And again, understanding that it's deeper than just generationally, like I, it's seen as a weakness. It's, it's probably other factors that are in play here. And so really starting to tackle those and address those so that people feel comfortable accessing mental health care and then understanding it too, understanding mental health services and understanding that not everybody because research shows that um, the BIPOC community is significantly diagnosed with schizophrenia at higher rates than their counterparts. Now, is that really truly the case or is there some lack, lack of cultural understanding? Is there a lack of religion understanding? Um, a reason why some th certain things are happening. So I think really uh, you have to start to unpack that step by step 
And that starts with being culturally competent and understanding like what's around you, asking questions, doing assessments like Parker said. Great. Well, we are running out of time, so I want to thank you all. Um, basically, I'm going to recap what I heard today, that the need is great as well as the disparities are great. Um, we can look at this through culture competency in cultural competency issues like representative counselors, um, understanding the connection between faith, culture, and the individual seeking mental health, but also connecting programs um, as well as we can and addressing um, systemic issues such as Medicare reimbursements and um, uh, the, the criminal justice system. So I wanna thank you all for sharing your thoughts and expertise with us this morning. And special thanks to First Financial Bank for sponsoring our conversation today. Also a special thanks to the Indianapolis Neighborhood Resource Center and the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance, our cross-marketing partners. Um, again, the conversation has been recorded and will be available on our COVID-19 hub. Just a quick a preview of upcoming events. Due to the continued success of this program and support of First Financial Bank, we are excited to announce that the Changing for Good series will continue throughout 2021. Our next program will be leveraging community loan centers to increase family economic resiliency. A little going back to what I heard today's program of just putting a Band-Aid on stressors, um, economic stability is one of those um, definite um, wounds that needs to be helped with not only a band-aid but some systemic research and programmatic re programmatic programs <laughs> um, and community loan centers are definitely one of those programs so as we sign off i want to thank you um, for joining us if anyone is interested in the benefits of pi membership please contact our engagement director rita o'donoghue our deep gratitude to marcus monique and kendra for an amazing conversation and we appreciate everyone for joining us. Before you sign off, please complete a short three question uh, evaluation that will pop up on your screen momentarily. We hope to see you July 26th for the Community Loan Center conversation and to continue changing for good. Thanks everyone.